I mean, this was. Could the, I uh, could I ask you a question about ask about two this? Questions. That uh, the point came up. Uh, Mr. Jacobs brought it up. The the fact that you see in America is I agree with him completely. You get this feeling that Griffith wants to do what a lot of people have done traditionally. They've said these, all these developments have been a series of internal adjustments. We've had a series of civil wars. The, the last civil war was between uh, two large blocks of uh, part of the of a major part of the English-speaking world. They were evolving, and they had to fight the issues out in this horrible process because they couldn't politically adjust without struggling to see where the real center of power was and, and so on. So the Civil War is, is a civil war indeed. Then going back, it's the War of Independence is a civil war among the British peoples to see whether or not the, this nat large natural unit will be allowed to govern itself internally and, and to recognize the power relationships internally rather than have to deal with the mother country and so on. And he does, I think, s want, to, want to look at it not as a revolution, but as a series of evolutionary upheavals, uh, but internal adjustments. Now, thinking of that, I think that's true, but I think one thing we leave out that is to Griffith's credit is that he did see something else that was lasting and important. And it comes out in all these movies that he sees the tendency of some types of people, rightly or wrongly, to adjust and to find a solution through particular kinds of violence and to see some kinds of violence as, as totally berserk, like, like the villainous figures who need this violence as the only expression you know, of, of themselves. And I, I'd like to see whether, whether you would tie this in any way with intolerance, because it strikes me that that the the uh, the feminine you know protagonists, the heroines in in both Birth of a Nation and America, have absolutely no ideology. Ideology is out. They represent always the healers, uh, the, the suffering. sufferers, those who can absorb all this violence, the good ones. And uh, you have in the male parties then a split between uh, those who accept the necessity of dealing with the violence when it comes up and those who use it as their sole means of aggrandizement or expression. And the Griffith sees this as a fundamental world problem that is almost prehistoric and, and it's a lasting tragic uh, situation that has to be overcome. So he sees a real contest as an intolerance. He sees it, Griffith sees it as a world problem uh, that is not only prehistoric, but jugular and visceral. And this note runs through many films, but of course in, in uh, extremely uh, 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 heavy volume and sharp focus through the birth of a nation in America. But it isn't true though that, that the, uh, the, the heroines uh, 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 lack ideology. Uh, the, uh, the heroines in The Birth of a Nation have a very definite ideology, namely the, uh, the, the purity and the superiority of the white race. I mean, they, they are, uh, remember that they are all projected as, as virgins, vessels of absolute purity, not only sexual, but racial purity, too. Uh, it's less evident in America because the girl in America, as played by Carol Dempster, uh, really doesn't seem to know what it's all about. And uh, she's uh, embarrassed and maybe harassed by uh, the, uh, the Tory reactionism of her father, who was a doddering idiot, and, uh, uh, and the uh, revolutionary fervor of her young lover. Uh, but there's no evidence anywhere in the film, in any of the prints that I have ever seen, uh, that uh, uh, Nancy Montague as played by Carol Dempster, has the vaguest idea of what all the shouting and the shooting are about. If that is not true of Elsie Stoneman in The Birth of a Nation, who has a damn clear and very good workable idea of what it's all about. You know, and all but very uh, discreetly sidesteps the issue of the Civil War itself. And on, on the matter of the Civil War, I want to add one thing uh, to the very uh, 
uh, pertinent comments that you made. You see, we, uh, you know, we've all been brought up, we've all been taught from grade school on and from our homes uh, to refer to the American Civil War, uh, the, also known as the War of the Rebellion or the War Between the States. Remember that Charles and Mary Beard uh, in their major work, The Rise of, the Amer uh, the Rise of American Civilization, uh, projected the thesis that the American Civil War was actually the American Revolution, and uh, that the Revolutionary War of 1776 uh, was simply what it had been traditionally called the War for Independence or the War of Independence. And they not only thought of, but they wrote about the American Civil War as the revolution. It was a revolution uh, by, for them, by Northern capital and and the Northern radicals uh, against the established way of life uh, of the Anglo-Saxon whites, you see. And the North this time won. This is because the Beards regarded Northern capitalism uh, taken within the perspective uh, of, of the, uh, 19th, uh, the 18th and 19th centuries uh, as a revolutionary force. Uh, the Southern economy it was not only agrarian, but feudal in, in character and in structure. And the Beards interpreted uh, the, uh, the northern uh, crackdown of the South as a revolutionary action. This school of opinion persists. There are many people who, uh, who uh, uh, are just simply taken for granted that the American Civil War was actually the American Revolution and that the Revolutionary War was no, no revolution at all. Uh, their argument is uh, strengthened by the, the feeble results, the very meager results that came out of the American Revolution. Simply a break of a colony from a mother country, and, uh, and then the mother country uh, takes out reprisals uh, on the colonies 20 years later. The uh, British got uh, got their vengeance in during 19, uh, 1812. They burned the, 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 the capital, uh, and burned Washington, D.C. to the ground and uh, committed uh, havoc and, and uh, uh, chaos up and down the Atlantic seaboard, burned community after community, massacred uh, American civilians right and left. Uh, they didn't get the colony back, uh, but they... Uh, they certainly uh, meted out a terrible punishment. As a matter of fact, if it hadn't been for the Napoleonic Wars, they probably would have recaptured the whole thing. There was, there was not a spark of revolutionary spirit in, in the America of 1912 to combat the British. The, uh, the counterattack was strictly in the name of commerce. So we're not gonna let them take our, our loot away. And uh, this was enough of an incentive to fight back, but that's as far as it went. You know, after a, after a vengeance war like that, and that's what 1812 really was, it was a vengeance war by the British Crown, you would think that the former colonies would have, been, would have become more revolutionary than ever. And they would have said, well, now, now we know. We don't want any last vestige of, of this old feudal kingdom that, uh, that belongs to the old world and, and not to our new world. But nothing of the sort. It, uh, it, it all petered out. Uh, there were claims for damages. This is all that it meant, and that's as far as it went. Oh, yes. <coughs> that's right. As a matter of fact, there is far more than a mere suspicion that the only reason that New England finally uh, abandoned the idea of, of quitting the newly formed Union uh, was that uh, they, uh, they looked across the seas and saw that uh, Europe was again going up in flames, Napoleon was once more on the rampage, and this they did not want to get involved in. Furthermore, there was the pull of the South. The South already uh, had very definite plans uh, for seceding. Uh, they were simply biding the time to pull away at the right moment. That union was the shakiest and most rickety structure that you could ever imagine. It was like a, 
an ancient uh, buggy uh, without the horses, uh, with one wheel already gone, and, and the other just uh, rolling by accident down the rest of the road. Oh yes, listen, the, you, 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 you're so right. The, listen, the only objection to parasitism and slavery that came from the North uh, came from a, a small minority uh, of, of radicals known as, uh, as the abolitionists. And they did not represent the masses of people of the North or the Northern industrialists either. The Northern industrialists eventually saw other possible advantages in, uh, in conquering the South. Uh, these advantages had nothing whatever to do with the abolition of slavery. <laughs> Quite the contrary. <laughs> they looked at slavery with eyes just shining green with envy. <laughs> but look, they're looking at it right now that way. What do you think they want now? A slave population with the boys in the black gown telling everyone what he or she is allowed to read and to think and, and, and so on. They, 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 they wish they could have it. Yeah. I wonder if you could, if you could explain you know, what, what uh, came out before in your comment. Uh, why is it, do you think, that Griffith in the movie, uh, when he deals with America, with his own country, and let's admit that he has this, this glowing kind of hazy ideal of the English-speaking people as a superior civilizing force that's here in the world right now. Let's say he honestly, and I think he did seriously, that the English-speaking world has evolutionary potential in it, that it, that it was uh, perhaps going to be a, a spearhead for the future and so on, however that might come about. Why is it, in your opinion, that uh, he can feel such a, a visceral uh, sense of outrage when he sees something remote, like, uh, like let's say, uh, the Persians attacking in Babylonia, and he can feel it. Or I even, I even thought that one place where Griffith really feels his policy again is in the, is in the segment of the towers where the struggle of the, of the, of the workers against the capitalists is going on well, he no longer has to think about uh, something like the United States, but he sees a struggle of forces. With it seems to me, we, we always tend to look at everything negative. Uh, oh, no. In his sociology, let's say, but when, when he talks about people's struggle on an, on, on an individual level, the worker facing the capitalist who's deciding his fate remotely from the big office of the spider. That's right. Uh, he really feels that. Oh, and how? Uh, he listen. He, he well, look. You say we we think of him negatively because we made a few, uh, I think, justified criticisms of certain uh, deliberate and inexcusable omissions uh, from America. But this man was a great dramatist. He was a supreme dramatist, the, the, the greatest, probably the greatest of all time. And what what he did above everything else was to fling himself. Uh, passionately uh, in, his, in his imagination uh, on the side of the, the victims, uh, the oppressed, as in the orphans of the storm in the, in the first half, uh, he is so completely, he so completely identifies himself uh, with the downtrodden, oppressed peasantry and, and proletariat of, of, of uh, 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 pre-revolutionary France uh, that you, uh, you, you, you feel almost as if he had, had come from uh, one of those families. In the second half, during the reign of terror, he uh, flings himself with equal uh, uh, imaginative passion uh, on the side of the victims of the guillotine, you see. But whichever side it is, I mean, he, Griffith is there. Well, first of all, I don't agree with talking about something, you know, about something here. Uh, I guess it starts before the comment you made about how uh, Griffith's team, uh, this, uh, uh, this the split man, you know, the, the, the innocent woman, the non ideological woman, and then the man who is uh, violent, and the man who, by, by counter violence, tries to 
you know, meet that balance and preserve the, uh, the woman, whatever, okay? Um, I, th I think, first of all, you know, uh, Griffith's value and his genius is that he doesn't see any of this. He doesn't see a thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, uh, here, here. Let me, let me, let me, let me, Hello. Let me, let me finish. That, uh, that he is no social commentator. He is not a, you know, a, a reader of history. He's, he, uh, what his power is is that he's expressive of history. He, does, he doesn't uh, see these things, he believes those things without question. And they just, you know, they, they come through him. He's a voice, he's a voice of a certain kind of people, of, you know, culture. Of, he's a voice of history. He's not a commentator on history. Let me, let me finish, okay? Uh, he lacks distance. He is not, as you said, an intellectual. He expresses the verities. He believes it. And it comes through him. Also, that, um, that the reason I think that he can uh, w work with the Persians and, and, as you say, you know, um, become so passionate about it, is that I think he just, you know, digs lust and fire and, you know, activity. You know, it's act it's well, that's all right. That's a part of history. Yes, but he, he just relishes this stuff. It's excitement. He's a good movie fan in that way. He's a great dramatist. He's a great dramatist. He says, and you say that he... he, uh, he um, uh, identifies uh, with the victims, no, no matter what the era is. And I don't think that's true. I think that uh, that he uh, he doesn't identify with them. He creates them because you know they're part of the story. He also creates you know the victimizer. They, they all come out of Griffiths too. Like, like every character comes out of Shakespeare. You know, he found all uh, uh, Shakespeare finds Lady Macbeth in him. All the victims and the victimizers come out of the same person, and they all came out of Griffiths. He's on all sides. Wait. They're all him. He is not. To me, I don't think you know he. Uh, he he is uh, releasing the whole you know, the whole drama. He's not a dramatist in terms of uh, well, you know, you won't believe. He um, he's not like just you know coming upon something and dramatizing a situation. That's you know the historical drama exuding itself. I don't mean in the in the historical sense. Actually, he's the camera eye who views the entire world from the perspective of outer space and he encompasses the whole thing, the totality of the struggle on both sides. I wish I knew one half, one half of the history that Griffiths had forgotten before he started directing films. No one, absolutely no one to this day has placed on the screen as authentic and as definitive a, 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 a depiction or portrait of the French aristocracy on the eve of the French Revolution as Griffiths. The recreation of the marble court at Versailles and of the life of the French aristocrats and, and orphans of the storm should be preserved forever because you know that this is exactly how it was. It, I, I think that uh, he's a, uh, Griffith was a great uh, reader, I mean, I, you know, what, what I read of his childhood, a great reader of romances. Oh, he was. Oh, definitely. And that's what definitely. he's like, That he's not involved with history, that, you know, that, that it's some, not about history, that, he, that he's very concerned with artifacts of history. He's you know, thrilled by the artifacts of history. But they're 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 pulled out of their context, and that context is you know remote from him. He's he's, he's excited by you know by the kind of romance they you know they claim in this. How, how, how what do you mean when you say they're pulled out? Also, also, what? Also, well, when some of you about the, about the workers and the capitalists, I think that I think that's one more capitalist Indian story. I know you're going to be angry at that. No, but wait a minute, wait a minute, Ken. What do you think the struggle between American capital and American labor was during the first quarter of this century anyway? If that wasn't cowboys and Indians and cops and robbers, I don't know what it was. It, 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 you had only to put the costumes on them and you had it. Right, but some people... It was know, a bloody Western. Yeah, but some people get involved you know, with what issues are being fought and some people just, you know, just get uh, involved with the... The issue for the Griffith, the, fighting, the economic the issue for Griffith took an emotional form, greed. Griffith was not alone in this. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the emotional uh, uh, approach to the, uh, to the economic base was, uh, was Stroheim's too. Of course, Stroheim, uh, it, it's true, Stroheim came out of Griffith. But it's... <laughs> But the other thing is, uh, one thing that lets me miss, I, uh, I feel, and I think that's from America, is that uh, uh, he is talking about a classless society. 
you know, the girl from the upper class and the boy from the lower class. Right. You know, uh, and that's like you know a huge point in this movie, something that wasn't taking place elsewhere and was an important thing happening in a new mercantile, totally mercantile society, separate, you know, from the uh, you know the, the residue of royalty and nobility. No, but that wasn't a. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute, this, Ken. This was, that that this is. Was a, uh, this was not a proletariat revolution or anything, but it w certainly it was a. Uh, a bourgeois revolution. It was, but listen, Ken, the United States must be given credit for that. Because here in the United States, a girl who comes from a poor family uh, has no difficulty in marrying a guy who comes from a wealthy family, or vice versa, a guy from a poor family can marry a wealthy girl, and it happens every day in the week. Uh, there are none of the uh, barriers that persist to this day throughout Europe. And in this respect, uh, the old world, meaning all of Europe, uh, remains the same hell in 1970 that, that it was in 1270 or 970. Nothing has changed there. In, in, in a few of the large cities, such as Paris or Marseille or, or uh, Stockholm or Copenhagen, uh, there is a certain amount of overlapping. But even there, it's extremely difficult. The case lines in, in European civilization are beyond belief. And they've hardly been shaken at all, despite all the devastation and the, the tens of millions of lives that have been uselessly sacrificed by all of the European powers in one, one war after another. And, they, and, and Europe still is the graveyard of the world. There's really no reason that Europe should be allowed to exist. If the, the, it, it, actually, it, it, would be a, it, it would pay the American people if they were a free people. They are not. If they were as free as they think they are, it would pay them to pay Red China to obliterate all of Europe in a yellow flood. Europe is, Europe is the cesspool from which all the damage originally sprang. And the, the, the tragedy of the United States is that to this day, it has not succeeded in making a new country out of itself. It is still an, ex, an extension of the old world, a continuation of the old world, founded, founded no less, by ex-convicts and criminals uh, from Europe uh, who found uh, uh, happier hunting grounds uh, for their crimes uh, on this soil. The other element that, that, that uh, started seeing off a very important mention too, like the, uh, the harassed religious groups, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the new capitalists, um, no, I guess that's it. That's well, the, 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 the religious groups are a part of the tyranny. As a matter of fact, uh, their mythology from the way back uh, really started the whole thing. Uh, even to some extent shaping the economy. It's true that according to Marx, the economy uh, shapes the uh, superstructure, uh, but there is a reciprocal influence too. And uh, the, uh, the, same, uh, the same pile of money uh, can be used very differently in different hands, and what dictates uh, the motion of those hands uh, is, is the idea or the image in the brain. And uh, the, uh, the, the, for my money, the whole thing uh, begins uh, with a mythology that, uh, that that should have been challenged from the start and, and wasn't. At that time, apparently, no one was challenging anything. 2,000 years ago, there were nothing but whirling dervishes. Uh, we're the victims of these dervishes. You know, we, we shouldn't laugh about them. They, uh, they have done great damage well, to us. I wonder if I could say something uh, that is not really contradicting what, what you've just said about Griffith, but I'd, li I'd like to correct it by redefining what you said in a way. Uh, I would agree that Griffith is not ideological in the way that we often expect people to be today. We think they're going to take a stand or have a well-worked-out philosophy uh, that is supposed to be an immediate response to problems right now. Well, I think if you look at Intolerance, you can see these other movies in the light of intolerance better. After all, think of the fact that Griffith deliberately tries to show some kind of dialectic in history in intolerance. Now granted, he's uh, tremendously influenced by what you call the romance. And he sees all stories in terms of, you know, archetypal stories, it's always this story. But he, he shows us, as no other movie maker has ever dared to, something corresponding to a model for all of human history. And that model goes back thousands of years. It goes back 
several thousand years before uh, we start our, our reckoning, our time reckoning. In other words, Griffith is the only person who attempts something like millennia, and he shows it by cross-cutting four different stories, which is well known, and going through this cross-cutting is also, a, as Seymour's point out, a constant switching of sides because he knows that the ideological label is often a fraud, a deception, part of the enslavement and imprisonment. So, for example, in the one scene, he has the little uh, Protestant kid being hidden in the very feminine skirts of the Catholic priest who takes mercy on him. And, and in another, uh, another scene, he has uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Catholic girl praying to the Virgin Mary and the wicked capitalist is straight from Towney or Veblen. He's, he's the, the spirit of Protestantism, you know, and the rise of capitalism. So that um, although Griffith understands that, that some of these evils of puritanical strain of capitalism um, is associated with Protestantism, although he understands that a certain moment of fanaticism was associated with, with the Catholic uh, party in, in Renaissance France and so on, he doesn't lose his head over this and make an, make a, an absolute ideological leap uh, and blind himself to all the complexities of history. What he tries to see instead is a basic dialectic. And although he's anything but a Marxist, he sees that it's a right. dialectic of the oppressors and the oppressed. And he sees another...